uh, reporting and communicating mobility and migration. And I have uh, an able team of experts. Uh, of course, Professor has been introduced already, Professor Monica Chibita. She's going to be our keynote speaker. We have uh, Ms. Peggy Ayesga um, from the Office of the Prime Minister. We have Mr. Rob... We have Mr. Robert Mawanda from the ILO in Uganda. International Labour Organization. We have Mr. Richard Kaira from the Vision Group. And uh, Mr. Frank Walusimbi has just stepped out and he will be joining us um, uh, shortly. So for this session, we are going to listen to Professor first for a few minutes. And then after that, we'll have um, a few minutes again to listen to the people we have here because they are dealing directly with organizations that are involved in activities of migration and mobility. And then we'll also have a few minutes uh, to have a conversation with uh, all of us in the room. So ladies and gentlemen, to kick start us off uh, is our keynote um, speech that is going to be made by uh, Professor Monica Chibita. And unfortunately, um, our podium has got a bit of issues. I am going to request Prof to present from where she is. You're most welcome, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, John Baptist. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, they said it's a conversation. And conversations don't usually begin with protocol. But I would like to recognize everybody that is here, starting with the university administration, our friends from Germany and the partner universities and institutions, um, colleagues from the department, and students as well, plus all our guests. I recognize and appreciate your presence here. Um, it's a great honor to be here. It always is. And my topic is communicating migration and mobility, challenges of the 21st century. And the topic was crafted in such a way whether, so that you did not know whether the challenges were challenges of the 21st century or challenges of communicating mobility. So in my own wisdom, I have conflated them. Uh, greetings from Uganda Christian University. We have Mr. John Semakula here, uh, who is my colleague at UCU and head of the undergraduate program at, uh, at Uganda Christian University. Um, <coughs> journalists are in the business of telling stories, so I'm going to start with a short story. And this is a story about somebody called Fatuma, not her real name. Um, Fatuma worked with us at home for five years. And then she left to start a family with Juma, her husband. And Juma is not his real name either. They struggled to eke out a living for a few years, but soon Juma was diagnosed with cancer when their first and only child was eight years old. Juma died within two months of diagnosis. We were concerned about Fatuma and we appealed to her to come back and work with us and would look after her and the child. But to our surprise, she had other ideas. She said somebody had offered to take her to find greener pastures in the Middle East and that she already had her passport. To cut the long story short, Fatuma left. Four years later, she was able to return only under the guise of needing some special surgery. She went back after that surgery, in inverted commas, to complete her term with her employer. She was supposed to do another term, but she decided she didn't want to stay any longer, and she returned with the few savings that she had and set up a small business. And her daughter is now about to finish secondary school. Fatuma's is only one story, about one form of migration, which is labor migration. But the story of her departure, her transit, her arrival and integration, the obstacles she found, the opportunities she got, etc., helped me to look at migration with a human eye. When I read a migration, when I read a migration story today, I am conscious that beyond the statistics, 
there are human beings involved with family ties, with emotions, with dreams and aspirations, and with futures. I recognize that there are many actors, there are different fortunes, and there are complex political and legal negotiations involved. I am involved with World Vision, and we have many refugee responses going around the world. At, at some point, I think there were, we were told there were 37, 37 spots in the world that needed emergency response due to conflict um, and other factors. So as I share different numbers and figures, I appeal to you to think of Efatuma and her family and her anxieties and her aspirations and her achievements and disappointments. I challenge you to think of the person behind the story, and I challenge you to think in terms of a full story, not just one facet of it. In the 21st century, the migration story has been a story of interest both in Africa and in Europe. Telling the story of how migration around the world is changing from a range of different perspectives, including economic, social, and security dimensions, and legal and policy frameworks starts with an understanding of fundamental metrics. And journalists are in the business of looking for those metrics. There are numerous sources of data, and uh, they may be grouped into statistical data sources, which relate to national population census surveys and so on, or administrative data sources, the kinds that you, you have access to from immigration officers and people who process people with visas and work permits and so on. Uh, some of these data are not fully recognized as credible sources of official data, but the statistics can help in identifying and analyzing migrants. There are also innovative data sources that come from large volumes of data, sometimes referred to as big data, and they are generated mostly through mobile phones, internet-based internet social media, and online payment services, many coming in from the private sector. There is ongoing research to see how such data can be leveraged to throw more light on forced dis displacement, transnational networks, human trafficking, or to estimate remittances, which is a big issue. There are several credible sources of data which many journalists would be familiar with. Some of them are seated at this table. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the International Organization for Migration, the United Nations De Department of Economics and Social Affairs, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and others. There are also reports like the World Migration Report that update migration data and trends annually through rigorous processes. There may occasionally be challenges with precision because of the conditions under which some migration data must be collected. But there are enough opportunities for triangulating this uh, information to come out with a reasonable figure. Of course, then there are human sources, not least of whom the migrants, refugees, and internally displaced persons themselves. I have relied on a variety of these data sources. I've also relied on the World Migration Report. And please take this as my acknowledgement of them, as this is not structured like a typical academic paper. Human migration may well be an age-old activity. Uh, it started a long, long time ago. Our grandparents, great-grandparents, uh, were involved in some kind of migration. In fact, people keep telling me that my parents or forefathers must have parents must have migrated from Rwanda. In, in, in spite of all efforts to explain that I don't know any relative of mine that originates from Rwanda, even at the airport in Amsterdam, they ask me how things are in Kigali. So, so it's affected societies for a long time. However, it's been changing in important ways, particularly in the 21st century. Examining shifting trends in terms of their scale, direction, the demographies, the frequency of migration can illuminate important patterns in migration and journalists have a responsibility to ensure that this examination is accurate, balanced, comprehensive, contextual and professional. 
Migrants today account for 3.6% of the world's population compared to 2.8 at the turn of the century, which means the numbers have gone up. In all regions of the world, the number of migrants in the 21st century has been on the increase. However, it's important to note that even though this may be the case, the fact that only one in 30 of the world's population are migrants or refugees means nearly 96% of the world's population are not leaving their places of origin for another place, either forcibly or voluntarily. The majority of the world's population is staying put. Even though reading, listening to, or watching the media, it may seem like the whole world is on the move. Of course, there is internal migration or internal displacement taking place as well, and we shall return to this. So one of the biggest challenges that journalists have in covering migration and mobility uh, is difficulty in distinguishing between terms such as migrants, immigrants, refugees, internally displaced persons, and so on. Don't worry, I'll not attempt to define all of them here, but for purposes of our discussion today, I'll talk about one or two that I'm concerned with. So I'll focus on migrants, refugees, and internally displaced persons. And I'll use the IOM or UNHCR definitions. By migrants, I mean any person, and this is not my definition, I take the definition, any person who is moving or has moved across an international border or within a state away from his or her habitual place of residence, regardless of their legal status, whether the movement is voluntary or involuntary, what the causes of the movement are, or what the length of stay is. That is a migrant. So that covers a lot of categories. By refugee, on the other hand, we mean any person who is outside their country of origin for reasons of feared persecution, conflict, generalized violence, or other circumstances that have seriously disturbed public order, and as a result, re require international protection. So the issue of it is refu a refugee is usually a forced migrant, and also they require protection, and usually it's related to unpleasant circumstances where they are coming from. It has become fashionable now for Ugandans to find a ticket and go to a place and say, I am persecuted, my life is in danger, and sometimes it is. Don't get me wrong, sometimes it is not. There are other categories, and of course one can say, who are you to tell that it is not? There are other categories like asylum seekers, irregular migrants, undocumented immigrants, but we'll focus on the three above that I have mentioned, and bring the others in only, as and only when we require them. Somebody called Herbert Barber introduced the term VUCA in the context of the United States military in 1987. And VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So it has been said that we live in the 21st century, we live in VUCA times. If we were to unpack these four words, we would come up with a long list that includes conflict, civic unrest, contestations over homes and identities, natural disasters, economic and power inequalities, technological innovation or disruption, depending on which side you're looking, and so on. The COVID-19 pandemic wrapped all of this into one package, creating what one might call the VUCA event of the 21st century. It makes sense, therefore, to start with it in discussing the challenges of covering migration in the 21st century. With the COVID-19 pandemic came broken economies, the elevation of low-skilled labor to essential service status, an unprecedented number of deaths, manifestations of hate and xenophobia, new manifestations because these were always there, short and long-term effects on mobility, labor markets, international relations, health systems, security, etc. The pandemic also brought to the fore the, the damage that misinformation and disinformation can do. Mental health cases went up among people on the move who were stranded, broke, often had limited access to the full benefits of even the most basic health care and particularly mental health care. 
Many of them were separated from their families for periods much longer than they had anticipated. I ha we have a student who went to one country in Europe on an exchange program and then COVID broke out. He had to come out and he went into isolation. And every time he was about to finish his days of isolation, a new case would test positive and he would have to start again. And he ended up staying there for much longer than he had anticipated with adverse health effects. Migrants were more likely to lose jobs and many people slid into extreme poverty after losing their jobs, their immigration status, and sometimes both. I'll talk a little bit about the profile of migrants and refugees. And this is not exhaustive, but I'm picking out the highlights. Most migrants over the last century have been male, although the margins between male and female have remained narrow. There was an increase in both males and females as well as labor migrants overall over the last decade. The majority of refugees as of 2021 came from Syria, Venezuela, Ukraine, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and were hosted in neighboring countries. It's important to note that refugees typically are hosted in countries fairly near their homes unless they are airlifted in a special way or there is an, an arrangement between countries. The top five uh, refugee hosting countries by 2020-2021 were Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda, and Germany. While conversely, two-thirds of all international migrants live in just 20 countries, the majority of them in the United States, but also in Germany and Saudi Arabia, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, and several other countries. So where have people been migrating from? According to the IOM, the majority of people have migrated from, the, the, yeah, the largest number of people has migrated from Asia with India as number one. People have also migrated significantly from Europe, from Latin America, from the Caribbean, from Africa, the Middle East, and then North America. And where have they been going? The top migration destinations are the United States, followed by Europe, with Germany and Italy in the lead in Europe. By 2021, 11.6% of Europe's population were migrants. I don't know how many of you have traveled to the UK recently, and I don't want to determine statistics by looking, but you get a sense that there is a heavy Asian presence in the cities of the UK. The rest of the list of destination countries includes mostly high and upper middle income countries with only Egypt featuring prominently from Africa in the top 20 list. I would expect that South Africa would be somewhere there, but I don't have enough facts to be able to ascertain that. Uh, I know that South Africa ranks very highly within Africa as a recipient of migrants. Uganda features prominently when it comes to hosting refugees, where they are among the top five countries in the world, as I have just said. Why do people migrate? Most migration is triggered by a complex of factors that the literature has categorized as push factors, meaning factors originating from the people's area of origin, and pull factors which are related to destination areas. And I can only touch on these very quickly, but push factors include natural disasters, persecution, limited freedoms, human rights issues, unemployment, conflict, poor services like education and health, and so on. There is information about migration corridors, migra migrant deaths, and so on. I will not go into this. Pool factors would include what we call greener pastures here in Uganda. For instance, better wages, better medical care. In, in, in other words, the flip side of what I just said. The promise of security, greater room or perceived greater room for freedoms of movement, association, and expression. The media play a big role in painting pictures of the destination countries. Sometimes the countries also have aggressive recruitment campaigns to boost labor and change the demographic patterns at different times. So sometimes people are actually invited. 
There is a time I applied for a Canadian visa and got eight years. I had applied to attend a conference. I got eight years. I used it only once. I'm sorry to say. So sometimes these things happen. I think it was the season. So I'll talk about some challenges that have been typical of the 21st century. And I'll start with something that is an opportunity but is also a challenge, which is technological innovation. I've painted the context of migration. It's not exhaustive, but we have an idea in what context it occurs. What are the challenges? So much as technological innovation has made communication, data collection, migrant tracing, monitoring of routes, etc., more efficient, it has also contributed to the uncontrolled spread of misinformation and disinformation. The funding models of communication platforms make it difficult to cooperate with their owners in regulating the platforms, as that would be equal to them biting the hand that feeds them. While some attempts have been made to moderate these communication platforms using automation, which is a good thing sometimes, there is a limit to how much machines can do to navigate complex ethical issues. The human capacity to do this on their own is still inadequate. So this is an area of challenge that we have to deal with as people in the communication space. Misinformation and disinformation are not new. But with technological innovations of 21st century, the ownership patterns and so on, um, disinformation and misinformation have grown wings. Information spreads widely and rapidly, aided by the internet. Disinformation, which unlike misinformation, has the element of intent to it, spreads even faster when fueled by a network of tech-savvy people with a common, often negative, political agenda. Sometimes, news media fall prey to this scheme, get captured, and help multiply misinformation and disinformation. The situation I've just described, we are told, has contributed to a huge drop in trust for traditional institutions like the police and parliament, although these institutions may provide reasons of their own to be mistrusted. Not infrequently, journalists and media are lumped together with politicians and others as the enemy of truth, making it hard to access credible information from key sources. We somehow have developed a bad name. Journalists in specific uh, situations have been accused, sometimes with evidence, of triggering negative discourses about internal and international migrants. What comes to mind are the media in Rwanda, of course, around the time of the genocide, the media in South Africa, around different instances of xenophobic attacks, and the media in Europe, and the discourse of the migrant crisis around 2015, 2016. And I have migrant crisis in inverted commas, in, even in my head. Often these discourses frame migrants as a threat to the European way of life and to their jobs. The media have also sometimes helped frame migrants as a burden rather than an opportunity to be harnessed. Other accusations have been around negative reporting and oversimplification. A symbiotic relationship seems to exist between traditional and online media with, with them taking the lead at different times, taking turns. So online newspapers have the advantage of being instant and, and garnering feedback very quickly. They thus hold some promise, promise of facilitating debate and allowing a wide range of voices to be heard. Uh, the media that are not online have some other advantages like being trusted by government officials and so on and so forth. But the same opportunity that the online media have can also create the challenge that we call echo chambers, where people get into small cocoons of their own, of like-minded people, and only hear each other's ideas and begin to believe that that is all of reality. And the online media have, have, have the potential to contribute to this. So that is another challenge. There is also the increasing complexity 
of the phenomenon of human trafficking. Human trafficking, a growing part of migration is a complex affair. It usually involves more than one country, although it can be domestic. It tends to be run by people who combine it with other criminal activities, such as drug dealing, prostitution, forced labor, etc. The typical human trafficker is tech savvy, as they depend heavily on technology to keep in touch, transfer money, launder it, conceal information, evade security, etc. Trafficking in persons was first criminalized in the year 2000. However, its definition tends to be complex and multi-layered, and its operations highly disguised and sophisticated. So sometimes it's difficult even for journalists to tell whether what they are looking at is labor migration, legitimate labor migration, or human trafficking because of its complexity. Unlike smuggling migrants, human trafficking is associated mostly with forced labor, which may include forced sexual labor. Human trafficking puts the migrant in a vulnerable position or exploits their vulnerability around age, gender, socioeconomic status, and so on for gain. But this gain may just be power. It may not necessarily be money at the time. The migrant often finds themselves in a position with no agency and no option but to comply with the trafficker's agenda because the trafficker holds their life in their hands. It's common in sectors like domestic work, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, and hospitality where prostitution sometimes thrives. It's also uh, associated with forced begging. Yes, there's a such, a such a thing as trafficking people to, make, to force them to beg. Organ removal, arranged marriage, etc. Some of these things are familiar in Uganda because they have been reported recently. The other related but not identical challenge is the growth in smuggling of migrants, which is, I understand, slightly different. This is akin to slave trade, as it is strictly for direct financial transactions and gains, and calls for concerted efforts to bring its evils to light in a, comprehens a comprehensive way that results in appropriate intervention, and the media can play a key role here. There is also the challenge of the growing number of persons displaced by climate change related events. The IOM tracked trends in mobility, including those related to internal displacement events like disaster, which is sometimes related to violence and conflict. Sometimes the three happen at the same time. Women and children often represent higher numbers than men, particularly among displaced persons. There are a few exceptions. The Pew Research Center also tracks migration trends, and according to their 2021 report, the number of displaced persons rose sharply in 2020 compared to 2019, driven by a combination of conflict, disaster, or violence, or a combination. This included people displaced within their own countries. Three out of 10 displaced people were living out of their home country of birth by the end of 2020. The majority, however, were internally displaced. So the other seven were internally displaced. Then there were others who left their country but did not officially apply for asylum or refugee status, uh, particularly around the Venezuela crisis. And finally, in Europe and to a certain degree in Africa, those who moved from one country to another but within the same region. The period 2020 to 2022 is slightly different because the pandemic slowed migration considerably due to illness and travel restrictions, as I have mentioned earlier. This was compounded by the fact that most economies shrunk, people found themselves stranded, lost their jobs, and so on. Undocumented immigrants often found they needed to return home because they didn't qualify for health care in the countries where they were or, or they, their rights had suddenly been reduced by the, the pandemic. Urban dwellers also saw a need to return to rural areas, either because food was cheaper or they had lost their urban jobs. By the way, they were not welcome in the rural areas. Uh, remember, there was a time when if you went from, from the city to the rural areas, people were very, very cautious about being far from you because they thought you came with 
COVID-19. For journalists, this was a difficult period because of curtailed movement and fear of contact resulting in infection. Media houses also cut back on their workforce and work from home policies made reporting harder for many. There were challenges associated with resources to enable journalists to operate virtually. Of course, there were challenges with reaching sources as well. And one could argue that the quality of stories may have gone down as a result of that. But there were also opportunities, of course, like using mobile phones and, and so on. And we learned, actually, that journalism could be done differently. So what makes covering migration particularly complex in the 21st century, apart from the things that I have just talked about? I'll take a commercial break here to announce again that UNESCO has published a handbook for journalists under the title Reporting Migration and Refugees, Handbook for Journalists and Journalism Educators. I hear Susanna f uh, whispering that she brought a few copies. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Problems of migration. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so this, uh, somewhere early in this book, I picked up this quote, migration and forced displacement to, to explain the complexities of the 21st century. Migration and, and forced displacement are cross-cutting and multifaceted. They are highly international. They are cross-cultural and interdisciplinary subjects. They require knowledge in an array of complex and interrelated matters, including human rights, sustainable development, the media, journalism, public opinion at home and abroad, as well as political, economic, cultural, psychological, theoretical, and practical issues, and so on and so forth. Policies, laws, how NGOs work, all these things. So, to cover migration, you really must be prepared to understand very, very complex and multifaceted situations. Many of the authors of this book are seated in this room. I'll take the opportunity to ask them to raise their hand. The authors and editors, they are shy to do so. Yes, yeah, of, the, of the migration handbook. Of the, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mine was just a lowly forward. <laughs> so I encourage every journalist to get access to this book. I think it can be downloaded off UNESCO's website, free of charge. Uh, this book has incredible information uh, that would help a journalist to understand how to report on the complex situation that migration has become. So what's the media's role in telling the migration story? The big debate with regards to media reporting specific issues, including migration and mobility, has been whether the media mirror public opinion about these issues or they actually shape public opinion. This is a long and unending debate. My suggestion is that they do both, but probably they increasingly do much more shaping than simply mirroring, certainly in the case of reporting migration and mobility. In doing this, though, they contend with a number of challenges related to the complex developments that we have just seen above. And this takes me then to a very brief summary of our a study that we conducted covering migration between Africa and Europe in 11 countries, most of which are represented here. In 2020, a consortium of researchers led by Professor Susanna Fengler, of which several of us were on the team, embarked on a content analysis of leading online, of leading online outlets in Africa and Europe, covering one year from January 2015 to 31st May 2015. And we sought to establish how do the media in Europe destination countries cover migration from Africa, how do media in Africa, countries of origin, cover migration from Africa? What are the similarities and differences in coverage? Who, for instance, do the media in these places portray as key actors in their stories? What is the content? What is the form of the stories? And what is their tone? If you see me concentrating on Africa and Europe, it is because this project springs from that. 
the focus is on Africa and Europe. So we selected two mainstream online media outlets from each of 11 countries, and the study has since been published. I'll just run through very quickly the findings of that study. Using the same search terms and research tools, and applying as much rigor as we could, we found that there were much fewer articles from the African countries retrieved on the subject of migration from the African media outlets than those retrieved from the European media outlets, <coughs> even though that migration was from Africa to Europe. Ethiopia had the largest number of articles among the African countries, perhaps due to the events building up to what is called the Mekele Offensive in November 2020, which was a, a huge conflict. This could mean the African researchers were not as rigorous in their research or that not as many stories were archived in accessible databases and, and so on. But given the standardization of such terms and the general rigor of the study, we concluded that there is a significant gap between the volume of migration coverage in Europe and in Africa. And this was backed by the literature. While the number of articles from Africa over the one year period remained flat and low, Europe not only had much higher numbers, but there were clear peaks around major migration events. Countries where most migrants went, like France and Italy in Europe, had a lot more coverage than countries where Africans came from, like Ethiopia, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda. The more people applied for asylum, the more coverage there was. The articles from Africa were mostly opinion pieces, while the European outlets had more news articles. Most articles in the European outlets had Europeans as main actors, even though the stories were about migration from Africa. Subjects were dominated by dramatic events like ship and boat accidents. These were followed by European migration policies as well as other countries' migration policies. There was not as much focus on the contextual factors, and this is very important. There was not as much concern about the factors that led to migration or the circumstances under which people left or under which they transited to their destination country. So things like economic hardship, political religious persecution, climate change, etc., were mentioned in passing or not at all in many of the stories. There was more interest in migrants once they arrived in Europe in terms of their accommodation, integration, well welfare, etc. Another issue was that Africa was sometimes treated as one country in some European coverage, so the nuances of individual countries of origin were lost. African media outlets covered, on the other hand, coverage, on the other hand, was dominated by the dangers that accompanied migration. There was ironically more focus on European migration policies in the African media outlets than on those of the countries of origin. So you found much more reported about migrants' rights in the countries where they go, their privileges, their opportunities for permanent status, etc. Like their European counterparts, African media outlets were more focused on the story after migration than the origin or transition story. So themes like integration, discrimination came up often. On the contrary, issues that one would consider like hot potatoes did not come up. While European media had citizens and refugees as well as political actors as main actors, African media mostly had political actors and representatives of international organizations like the UN agencies. As main actors, they also had very, very few voices of refugees or internally displaced persons. Potentially, uh, so potential migrants and civil society in the countries of origin were not prioritized either. And it was not clear whether this was due to lack of capacity to report in more depth or a culture of protocol reporting where the big person gets reported first and then the next one and then by that time there is no space for the ordinary person. It was also not clear whether reporting potential migrants was considered unsafe for local journalists in politically, economically unstable contexts. I guess we'd have to do more research on that. It should be noted that a considerable number of the stories in the African media outlets were drawn from the international wire services like Reuters, AFP, and so on, 
rather than originated by local journalists. A number of things emerged from this study. One, there, was, there were indications that migration reporting in the countries of origin was uh, sometimes curtailed by limited newsroom capacity and resources, limitations on press freedom, and concerns for self-preservation, as well as the culture of protocol reporting. There were aspects of elitism, particularly in the African media outlets, with ordinary people, including migrants, rarely featuring. Whilst there was a higher volume of reporting on migration in the destination countries, the reportage tended to be inward looking and to pay little attention to the context. The overall tone of reporting, both in African and European countries, was negative or at best neutral, relatively rarely uh, positive. There were more negative stories coming out of the African media outlets than the European ones. The reportage on both continents was lacking in context. Political, economic, and cultural factors contributing to migration received scant coverage. And we could debate the, the causes of that. This was a one-year snapshot. But you can see that it confirms a lot of the challenges that we have discussed that, that are documented in the literature elsewhere. Uh, if we were look, to look at the entire 21st century, the picture may be different, but maybe not very different because the century is advancing. As I conclude, we have work to do. And the COMPASS project, which was launched this morning at this conference, has a plan. We look forward to seeing how it unfolds to strengthen the capacities of, and networks of journalism training institutions and media houses to report migration, mobility, in more informed, accurate, contextual, nuanced, and meaningful ways. I thank you and wish you a productive conference. Thank you very much, Prof, for that very powerful presentation. Yeah. You know what happens when a professor speaks. Uh, I will not dilute what she has talked about. Uh, she has led us into the conversation, and now um, uh, we have a panel that is going to uh, dive into this conversation as well. But before we get there, it would be important to uh, know who they are and what their organizations are doing, uh, so that when we are conversing with them, we know what they are involved in. And uh, just a small announcement, uh, our places of convenience are in the next floor. So you just step out through the door and then there are stairs and uh, uh, you um, you'll be able to be helped uh, there. Now I'll start from um, uh, this side, from Mr. Mawanda. So Mr. Mawanda, briefly, uh, we just want to know what is the International Labour Organization doing on these issues of mobility and migration, maybe in a minute or two. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's just uh, afternoon. Yeah. Uh, Robert Manda is my name, and I come from the International Labour Organization. I'm based in Kampala. Of course, as our institution, we have to acknowledge uh, the work of IOM. Most of the people know about IOM as uh, spearheading migration issues. But on the other hand, even International Labour Organization is a key player. And for our side, we look at the migration, mobility, and governance. As ILO, we are a tripartite organization. We work with government, employers, and workers, and they all have an equal voice. So in our main areas of operations, we support technical and financially those different sectors of players, and specifically for migration, we look at four broad areas, which include uh, engaging the private sector, the employers, as well as uh, government. And our main four pillars, we have the rights to work, we have employment, social protection, and social dialogue. And this includes the migrant workers. In our main focus is uh, promoting decent work for men and women, and this is where the migrant workers also fall in play. 
The other area where we support uh, policy and regulation reforms, especially with the government, in terms of supporting negotiations of bilateral labor agreements, we are all aware of the agreements between countries of destination and countries of origin. All that times, the countries of destination have a, a, an upper hand because they are trying to help us solve the solution of unemployment. So when it comes to negotiations, uh, you tend to find that there is a bias <coughs> looking at their own terms. We also support in tackling discrimination against migration, and this is where we want to involve the media more. Professor has talked about how the media is playing a key role, but our biggest question is, why is it that only unsuccessful stories appear in media? And yet, there are so many successful stories from our migrant workers. Is it because the media houses don't find them so interesting? We've developed a tendency in our country where we, we are happy with negative stories. But this has to change. Professor, I don't know whether you have some information about for the professionals that are out there in Europe especially from Uganda. We have so many professors in universities. We have so many people working in hospitals, medical industry, and also these are migrant workers. But when we tend to report or tend to bring out issues, we look at those that are either unskilled or they are low-income earners. We want to bring out that picture of saying that migration can be also a success story, especially when tackling un un unemployment. Okay. And to wind up, IL also has a media toolkit uh, on reporting forced labor and fair recruitment. And we've trained a few journalists in our country. Uh, some few months ago, we trained a few students, and they were able to produce some stories with their counterparts in Jordan. So, MC, I don't know whether I've been able to... Yeah, that's, that's a good that. start. We are going to continue with that conversation. Uh, you've you. asked Professor a question. Uh, she might uh, want to react to it later. Uh, Peggy, from the Office of the Prime Minister. Yes, Office of the Prime Minister, many things that this office is doing. We would like to know uh, what they are doing in regard to uh, migration and mobility. All right, thank you. Um, once again, my name is Aisiga Peggy. I work with the Office of the Prime Minister, but specifically in the Department of Refugees. Um, the Department of Refugees, uh, first and foremost, from a legal perspective, is um, the, houses the Secretariat for what is known as one, the Refugee Eligibility Committee and the Refugee Appeals Board. I hear a number of journalists reporting on how Uganda has received a number of um, refugees and asylum seekers, uh, but it's often not made very clear what the difference is, uh, like Dr. Shibita rightly pointed out. And so the processes for the determination of uh, asylum seekers to the point where they become refugees is done by the Refugee Appeals Board and the Refugee Eligibility Committee. The OPM also provides advisory uh, uh, policy and legal matters relating to the hosting of uh, refugees in Uganda uh, and uh, our international obligations because as you're aware migration and refugee protection is an international phenomenon and this is done with a set of uh, many many actors. Uh, the Office of the Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, provides protection of refugees and coordinates the provision of their services to ensure their social and their economic welfare. We do this by initiating and uh, identifying projects for refugees and uh, uh, until recently we started also identifying areas for the enhancement of the hosting, the hosting uh, districts. We also implement national and regional refugee development plans in line with uh, both our national priorities and our international uh, refugee practices. Lastly, we also give documentation uh, in the form of identification cards for both the refugees and uh, the asylum seekers so as to enable them um, be included into society and access services in the same way that nationals do. So very briefly, okay. that's really what OPM does. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Peggy. We are going to return to that conversation, especially of the other people who are not asylum seekers and refugees uh, who deals with them. And now we go to the Refugee Law Project. Uh, there are two of them. Uh, very briefly, they are going to tell us what they do and what their contribution to this discussion of mobility is all about. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Am I visible? No. No. Stand I should stand. Yes. I am. <laughs> My name is Susan Alupo, and I work with the Refugee Law Project. I'm an advocate of the High Court. So I'm pleased to be here and excited to have received the invitation. So briefly about the Refugee Law Project, we are a community outreach project of the School of Law, Makere University. And our vision is to ensure that all people enjoy their human rights, irrespective of their legal status. Capture that, irrespective of their legal status you must be able to enjoy your human rights. So we mainly work with refugees, asylum seekers, deportees, victims of human trafficking, internally displaced persons, and members of the host communities. All these are categorized in the umbrella of forced migrants. So the Refugee Law Project was established in 1999 to primarily offer legal aid to refugees and asylum seekers. But over the years, we've grown, and we now operate under five thematic programs. So one of the programs is the Access to Justice program that seeks to ensure that forced migrants access appropriate forms of justice while in the host country and live dignified life. So that program does a lot of legal aid through legal representation in courts of law. When refugees and asylum seekers come into the country, at times they get into conflict with the law and they need lawyers to represent them. You all know that private lawyers are very expensive. So what we do is to provide pro bono legal aid to them and ensure that they are ably represented in courts of law. But we also support them in the refugee status determination process. Of course, Peggy mentioned the office of the prime minister is in charge for granting refugee status. But at times when uh, asylum seekers come into the country, they don't have any knowledge of where to go. So we assist them with that, because they're supposed to legalize their stay within 30 days in the country. When they apply and they're also rejected, they, they, they come to us to assist in the appeal process and review process. We also do a lot of detention monitoring for those uh, in conflict with the law. You may be arrested and taken to prison, and, and the lawyers go there to identify those in need of uh, legal aid. The program does a lot of advocacy on issues of access to justice policy. So we advocate for reform in law policy and practice in this country on issues of migration. We are also involved in a lot of capacity building, and this is where we've been training journalists. Because we also report different on issues of migration. You find someone saying this is an asylum seeker, yet the person is an economic migrant. So there's mixed reporting. So what we did at RLP is to end of journalists to ensure that they understand refugee, understand refugee law and forced migration such that they are able to report correctly. So we are doing those trainings mainly in the refugee hosting districts. We've not done much in Kampala for the journalists here in the urban centers, but that's one thing that we're also doing. Uh, we have a, a program titled Mental Health and Psychosocial Wellbeing that basically provides psychosocial support to forced migrants. One thing you will need to understand is majority of forced migrants have suffered with the negative impacts of conflict. When you witness a loved one get killed, when you witness sexual violence, you can't remain the same. So when you come into the host country, you continue to grapple with the negative impacts of conflict. So what that program does is to offer them psychosocial support to enable them integrate and cope while in Uganda. We have the gender and sexuality program that uh, does a lot of prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence. My experience at RLP shows that when we screen 10, seven out of 10 by uh, sexual violence during, before, and after conflict, even in Uganda, some continue to suffer with sexual violence. So, violence. so we do a lot of advocacy at national level an international level on recognition that male, males can also undergo sexual violence. Then we have uh, the Conflict, Transitional Justice and Governance Program that seeks to address legacies of past human rights violations. When you speak about conflict, Ugandans have also undergone conflict. It's not only neighboring countries. So Uganda as a country has suffered conflict and all parts of Uganda have been affected by conflict. So that program basically supports the nationals who also continue to grapple with the negative impacts of conflict. So they do a lot of advocacy on uh, the laws and policies like very instrumental in passing of the TJ policy which is now an umbrella law that uh, speaks to aspects of reparations for victims of war. They also do a lot of uh, rehabilitation for war victims 
who have suffered conflict in Uganda. But I would also implore all of us to visit our National Memory and Peace Documentation Center in Kitgum. I don't know if you know where Kitgum is. It's in the northern part of Uganda. We have a museum there. We call it Uganda's only history clinic that documents and archives past and present conflict events. So if you want to understand Uganda's conflict history, please walk into the museum and you'll be able to know those. Organizations can speak to key issues affecting refugees, but they're affecting refugees, but also work closely with the young people, training them on video advocacy skills so that they can later speak for themselves. If refugee law projects cease to exist, these young people should continue championing for the cause. So those are our five thematic program. Oh, we have research and documentation. As a Finally. project, I'm winding up. As a project of uh, the School of Law, I think one of, of our obligations is to do research and document. So there are a range of issues affecting forced migrants that we do document on. So I would employ you to also look at our website and see some of the working papers that we have written. But we continue to do this. Thank you so much. And now we move to Mr. Kaira. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Prof. A very good afternoon. My name is Richard Kaida. I work with Vision Group. Refugee Law Project said they have five thematic areas. Uh, actually, there were six. Our contribution as Vision Group are in five areas. Uh, without fear of contradiction, I think I can say that Vision Group is the biggest media organization in Uganda uh, with 52.9 audience share combined. Uh, the five thematic areas where our contribution is, yeah. one is uh, taking the debate to the audiences, to the people. So we organize outdoor engagements, where stakeholders, the duty bearers, meet the citizens to discuss these issues. So that is one. Two, we do referrals for those people who have issues and they come to vision group. Then we do referrals if there are issues related to torture, then we, we usually engage the CSOs, ACTV, PLA, and others, so we do those referrals. But we also do what Prof called the protocol reporting, the conventional reporting for awareness purposes on these issues of, of migration. And then we do the talk shows, the studio talk shows, where we invite those with positive stories and of course the negative experiences and the duty bearers. We also do investigative reporting. And it is, in that, in, it is actually in that area where we try to uncover some of these issues that are difficult. And of late we did a, a wonderful project it, it was started in 2020, the Dubai series, where we sent an undercover reporter in Dubai, and she spent there a month as a housemaid. And then we compiled the, the series, and we ended up publishing in the newspapers, doing podcasts, and finally, we also published, I think I can ask for a commercial break. Yeah. So, and we published this book as Vision Group. I think I can stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaira. Last but not least, Frank. Thank you, Doctor. Good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon. My name is Frank Walisimbi. Uh, most people know me as a journalist. Yes, I am. I transferred my skills to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and I work there as a, a communications officer. UNHCR, maybe uh, most of you might have an idea what this organization is about. It's a UN refugee agency that works to ensure that everybody has the right to seek asylum and find refuge 
having fled from violence, persecution, and of recent, we have so many people moving because of the harsh uh, effects of uh, climate. And um, uh, if you ask me, I think uh, Djibouti is uh, contributing a, a number of refugees in this uh, particular aspect of uh, harsh climate. UNHCR in Uganda uh, is present mostly in the southwest and mid-southwest of the country and the West Nile. We are working to ensure that refugees and asylum seekers get the protection that they should get and the humanitarian assistance. Currently, as I speak, we have uh, 1.5 million people living as refugees and asylum seekers in Uganda in 13 districts, including Kampala. Uh, note the term refugees and as asylum seekers. The, the lady from the uh, refugee law project uh, was particular about that. Uh, I read reports that uh, don't, don't explain properly who an asylum seeker is, who a refugee is, but yes. we try on a daily to explain to the reporters we interact with that they are different. You, from asylum seeking to a refugee, yeah. So um, we are also working to ensure that uh, refugees get durable solutions or long-lasting solutions to the problem of, or, or rather their situation of being a refugee. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, most, the most recent that we, we, we've been working on quite, quite uh, emphatically is the, the voluntary repatriation, uh, the Burundi refugees who we are supporting to go back home, and today morning uh, over 100 were supported to go back home to Burundi uh, because uh, they believe it is now safe to go back. If they believe, they can go back. If one doesn't believe so, they have a right to stay here for as long as they like. We have refugees who have been in this country for over 20 years, and they, they contribute greatly to the country's economy, to the, to the, basically to the social economic uh, aspects of this country. They have all the rights, aside from the right to vote. And that's the beauty about the, the, the refugee policy in Uganda. The lady from uh, OPM can explain further about that. Open policy allows free movement, access to national services, uh, education, health, everything aside from voting. Uh, UNHCR is present in 137 countries, uh, uh, and uh, at the turn of the first quarter of last year, the number of refugees for the first time hit the mark of 100 million. There is over 100 million people living as refugees and asylum seekers. It's very worrying, but as UNHCR, we stand to that challenge to ensure that each one of those 100 million people and more gets the protection and the humanitarian assistance that they need. When refugees move into the country, they come with a lot of hopelessness, emotional pain and physical pain. They come with a lot of anger and hunger. Anger because they are forcefully displaced. To be sent away from a place you call home is a very sad thing. It's a very annoying thing. So we ensure they come in, get the emotional support that they should get, uh, the health screening. It's quite a lot that happens on the ground. But for now, I can leave it at that. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I now return to Dr. Ojara, and um, I want us to dive a little bit into a conversation uh, on the keynote. And one of the issues that Professor has raised is the issue of data sources, uh, data on mobility, data on refugees, data on asylum seekers. So when you look at the Ugandan context uh, in terms of this data, the availability of the data to help the media people report accurately. What, what would you say if everyone has their own figures? Uh, good, mo good afternoon. Um, good I'm afternoon. Dr. Pius Sajara, the Director of Fiji Law Project. On the question of data, data is also a contested issue, right? Um, and uh, you have to agree a criteria of what meets the standard 
to qualify as a data. So that needs a, a consensus of uh, experts. So it's important that there's an agreement on ad arriving at a certain set of data. I think that's important. It shapes conversation, um, and it also shapes uh, understanding the scale of the issue. Okay. Actually, talking about data, you know, uh, whoever, whoever sets the language of conversation determines the cause of that conversation and uh, eventually the outcome of it. I think the language of data is misleading also because data is only 